And uh, I'm now gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So uh, again, I'm, this is a very high level, uh, so I'm not going to get into the details, but just want to you know refresh everyone. So as everyone's aware, the Wake BRT Western Boulevard Corridor study was essentially initiated to help shape and leverage the opportunities around the upcoming Western uh, Bus Rapid Transit project for Western Boulevard Corridor uh, that is planned to connect downtown Raleigh to downtown Cary. And again, I think folks are probably familiar. So we have about four bus rapid transit projects that's being planned for four um, major corridors, uh, all within Wake County. And that was a recommendation of the Wake Transit Plan. So for this uh, Western Boulevard study, we focused on the area between downtown Raleigh, which is right you see on the map, and, um, and going all the way to care, you know, I-40 is the edge. And this is essentially the area we looked at for planning and land use analysis, which, with, which is within um, the city of Raleigh jurisdiction, uh, jurisdictional limits. Uh, for the purposes of the entire LPA or the locally preferred alternative, we had uh, the corridor and lysed all the way into downtown Cary. And also on this map, you see we included about half mile area of the water buffer around the corridor because that's usually considered the 10 minute walking distance. The little dots you see on the map, those are the proposed station locations for the bus rapid transit project. Um, and again, they, those will, they are not confirmed yet, but they are the proposed ones that came out of one of the uh, follow up studies from Wake County Transit Plan. And the line, the, the line, dash line that you see the, along the Western Boulevard extension, that is the route along which the new BRT will uh, go and connect um, Jones Franklin area to Cary Town Boulevard and, and up Maynard and into downtown Cary. That um, extension, the dotted line does not exist today, but it has been in our state plan for almost four decades or so. Uh, but that is now the determined or selected path for the BRT to connect uh, Raleigh to downtown Cary. We had uh, three major areas uh, included in our scope. The land use and market analysis that was led by consultant team. They looked at the development potential of the corridor uh, under circumstances, assuming that if we had the right transit oriented um, regulations and policies in place, what would that development capacity look like? We have a report that was also available online and, and essentially the summary of that study says that if ideal conditions existed, we would see an increase of about 50% in re residential uses and almost 100% increase in retail uses. The second, the LP analysis, which again was led by consultants and I, I showed you in the map, first map that I just shared, this selected route was endorsed both by Town Council of Cary as well as Raleigh City Council in fall of 2020. And the last uh, category, the open design opportunities, this is something we scoped in-house with uh, my team at the Urban Design Center. And what we looked at is physical improvements that could really enhance the quality of the public realm. And um, so you see the final report has a lot of those opportunities called out. The final report has um, all of the recommendations in four major uh, themes. Again, these themes were, um, were guided or informed by the community engagement process and all of the great, great community feedback we received. So topmost uh, of priority was the multimodal connectivity. Folks had, our uh, community had, had expressed how it's important it is to enhance the overall pedestrian bicycle infrastructure along the corridor. So that we have recommendations proposing new street connections, new bicycle networks, as well as um, access to greenways. Public REM enhancements. This is, uh, there's a large focus on the report looking at opportunities, again, ways in which design solutions can enhance the quality of the public realm. 
And the notion here is that every transit user at some point, whether you know you connect through a bike or at a stop, you're going to have that that phase where you're going to walk between um, between your destination. You get off of the thing, and so the quality of that public space really matters. And so we have found ways and identified ways where we could enhance on that transit-oriented development. We identified four major catalytic. TOD sites along the corridor, and they are the four major shopping center sites, simply because they are currently under one, uh, one um, ownership, they have single use and provides a great opportunity for redevelopment into a more mixed use walkable uh, transit oriented uh, sort of development that we would love to see um, as, as the corridor trans transforms. Last but definitely not the least, we got a lot of feedback about how it's important to uh, to encourage more sustainable design principles and practices as we see redevelopment over the corridor. So we do have some specific recommendations um, for a green TOD, sustainable practices, et cetera, on, uh, along, along the corridor. And especially because we have a lot of uh, sensitive areas um, or the corridor does travels along uh, several tributaries. And so it's really important to, to, to ensure that we look at more sustainable practices um, as, as development occurs over time. So, and then those are the uh, specific nodes or area recommendations. And we also have corridor-wide recommendations. Again, these are looking at the entire corridor and, and looking at um, opportunities. So those fall in for um, four sections, like we have street connections. So you see a lot of new street connections are being proposed. Again, this is keeping in mind how I emphasized in the report, multimodal connectivity was a topmost priority identified by the community. And, and that can be achieved only when we look at ways in which you can fix gaps and enhance overall connectivity between destinations and connecting neighborhoods to the opportunities um, that would come with the BRT. So those are new street connections. We have a, a ton of bicycle networks uh, proposed again the goal here is to enhance overall connectivity, multimodal access. So it's not just about getting cars. It's not just about only transit, but also finding ways in which, whether it's about through bike or additional connectivity, you know, providing access into greenways where you can overall enhance the the reach and and um, uh, connections across uh, across the uh, you know the neighborhoods and other destinations from the corridor. And you can see there's a little more emphasis or more connectivity you see in the west of uh, the Beltline, and that's because that's the huge area of opportunity with the new BRT corridor. We think there's uh, new opportunities, and so we are taking a forefront and trying to put that uh, street grid in place so you could guide future growth and development. Then we have area-specific guidance. These are little, uh, again, gaps and connectivity gaps, but uh, they are really uh, will follow only, again, when redevelopment happens because they're tiny little connections but makes a huge impact. And uh, it will be really very um, driven by redevelopment and by uh, private property owners. Environmental, this is again map. I talked about how environmental sustainability is important. Um, and this map shows ecologically sensitive areas along the corridor and how we can um, find ways to steer that green sustainable practices, whether it's integrating green stormwater infrastructure or providing um, more sustainable, uh, efficient green uh, methods of, of construction and development. So with the general recommendations, what's our next step? So we also have what's called the Comprehensive Plan Amendments Package, which is CP 1021. In that, what we do is we have called out specific policies and action items um, that would help us guide this transformation of Western Corridor over time. So we have distilled some of the recommendations that you see in the final report into, into potential policies and actions that can guide future development. We also have map amendments. These are specific uh, amendments specifically to the street plan, which is the T1 map and, and the bike uh, planned bicycle networks map, which is a T3 map. And so the amendments have uh, four sections, the area specific guidance, that's again, very specific to the Western corridor uh, boundary and, and calls out policies and actions. The section B, just adds the area or the boundary map of Western to the city's area plan locations map. 
Section C again adds new street connections and then section D adds bicycle facilities map. Now I wanted to take a moment here to explain what street plan amendments mean. And this is because we at the last OSCO planner session, we had a lot of questions about um, or concerns or comments about street plan amendments. So I'm gonna spend just a little extra time here today to talk and explain that. So when we typically do a planning process, we are assessing uh, obviously you know, opportunities to guide future growth and development. So we come up with recommendations for new street connections. Again, that is with the goal of enhancing connectivity and placing the grid work in place so that as you add, as redevelopment happens over time, it's more um, consistent, it's more orderly, and that we have enough access and multimodal connectivity. So when we, when we come up with those recommendations, we go through this amendment process, what's called the comprehensive plan amendment process. And we adopt, try to adopt those lines into a map called the T1, which you see on this map, on this slide, which is a map T1 street plan. So all of those networks that you see are in there with a type designation. And then again, many of these are, are for future implementation. So that's what the comprehensive plan amendment process is to adopt those lines into this map. Now, what it does not mean is there is absolutely no impact to your property at this point of time by adopting these lines onto the map. Nothing changes about your property or your use, but it, any impact would occur if you decide, you as a property owner decides that you're going to redevelop your property or make changes to the existing layout or you know if, if you trigger like a subdivision plan or a site plan review process that's when um when an impact kicks in and and then by that you mean we would be the developer will be required to dedicate right away and and partly construct where what's within new property especially for any new street connections shown so that kicks in only at that future point of time and that is again at the discretion of the property owner now the question is, why do we want to do these? What's the purpose? Well, the purpose is simply because it really provides the blueprint for future, as future redevelopment happens, we want to provide that grid work so that we can make sure, uh, you know, destinations and places of uh, growth are well connected. You have mobility options. And the intent here is that that way you can reduce congestion, future congestion, you can reduce the vehicle miles travel so that folks have other areas of, um, you know, connecting two places and not relying on just one major arterial, which could obviously get, you know, get congested, especially during peak hours and such. And uh, it also provides some certainty and consistency for streetscape because uh, as you see, some of these have designation for street types and these street types are all context sensitive. So it, they vary from based on your context and they all integrate what's called the complete streets principle. So the, what that means is each of these street types that you find in the comp plan also accommodate not just cars, but is also planning for pedestrians and wide sidewalks and also providing for bicycle, um, a bicycle network, you know, accommodating bicycles, bicyclists into the street section. So that's the huge difference or impact is that we are planning for multimodal um, design as, as redevelopment occurs. And again, the benefits are plenty, again, planning for, you know, providing orderly growth, providing more access, and mostly providing for walkability, because if you have a well-connected area, you don't necessarily have to hop into your cars. You can just be, you know, can be connected while walking, by through sidewalks, or you take your bike and, and get into these other streets, and you just don't have to get to your main arterials. So that's the, that's the little, uh, you know, um, intent or purpose behind these street amendments. And um, they are also supported, again, this approach is also supported by some, there are many policies in the comprehensive plan that talks about the importance of, of connectivity in streets, but I wanted to call out some of these where we talk about connectivity again, you know, guiding new development, redevelopment, um, providing for multimodal design, eliminating gaps, because that's what provides a higher grid density will increase mobility option and they pro provide greater access to surrounding land uses. 
And then road connectivity, you want to avoid cul-de-sacs and dead in the streets because that does not help with, um, again, greater access and um, your mobility choices. So a quick timeline. So we kicked off this process in late fall of 2019. So it's almost more than two years where we have multiple points of engagement, extensive community engagement. We released the final report in early summer of this year and again got many rounds of comments. And finally, we took the updated report and took it to council. So they have deferred this, this item to planning commission for their review. So the next step is we, the planning commission will be scheduling a meeting and I have just got information this today. Um, I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and I wanna note that while this process is, is, is wrapping up, the design phase for this, this corridor, which is the actual uh, process by which the, the station locations would be confirmed as well as uh, what this cross section, street cross section would look like as in how will BRT be integrated into this corridor will be confirmed by the design process that has um, that is underway and um, head Patel from chance it can uh, can answer questions if you're more curious about that but um, this is just a planning phase and we'll be wrapping up the planning phase but what's more important is the design phase which is actually going to really look at the details of the of the core the BRT and, and um, how it fits into the corridor. So that's the BRT design. And then what's next for Western? I do want to say that if right in this month, we also have what's called the TOD mapping process that's kicking off. At the very last city council meeting, uh, council endorsed city staff to move forward with what's called the uh, transit overlay district zoning map mapping process for both Western Boulevard as well as the Southern corridors, BRT corridors. So that process is kicking off soon. And also in the near future, and maybe not near, but probably in a year's time, we are also gonna look at station area planning process. And that's a process where we're gonna take a closer look at uh, hopefully the confirmed station locations at the time and looking at uh, more, uh, more details of, of land use and transportation networks and open design for these station nodes um, and how what are those opportunities. So that's the also upcoming. So what, uh, what we had done here is just a phase one that's wrapping up and there's more to come for Western. So it's, it's not the end of uh, you know, the planning process. So the TOD mapping that I just mentioned, I did wanna share this is led by the comprehensive planning group, and they have two virtual kickoff sessions planned for November 16th and 30th at 6 p.m. So you can actually go uh, to our website and, and try to type in, if you, if you don't see the website link here, you can also type in transit over logistic TOD mapping and, and try to do a search on our website. You should probably be able to pull this uh, web page uh, with the information on that because that is just as important uh, because it does bring opportunities for what um, the TOD can bring to the corridor and your properties. So that's in a nutshell, a quick overview. And I'm, give me a second, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, okay. And uh, I think uh, with that, I'm gonna just open up or Katie, you wanna moderate or however, but we, Okay, so I, one one important detail. So we were scheduled. I think we sent out letters to many of you about these OSCO planner sessions and the committee of the whole meeting. But what happened was it, the committee of the whole meeting was scheduled for um, October twenty eighth, and I know few of, many of you uh, attended it or at least try were present. We were all all staff was prepared as well. But unfortunately, the meeting had to cancel after waiting for about half hour because they, the, the planning commission could not get a quorum. Uh, they require a certain number of uh, attendees at the meeting to be able to have a quorum to, to take uh, action or have a discussion around any, any project or topic. So because they couldn't get a quorum, they could not uh, hold that meeting and they had to cancel it. And we, I guess on behalf of planning commission, we have to say we apologize for that. Again, I and staff don't have any control on that, but we do uh, apologize. So the last information I just got this evening is that they were not able to schedule a, a makeup. Instead, what they've deferred this item for the November cow meeting. And that's just gonna happen 
on, um, I understand, uh, November 18th at um, 4 p.m. And we will be blasting out emails and it will be posted on our website. But um, that's the latest information we have on, on, on that uh, committee of the whole meeting. Okay, with that, I see a few hands up. I see, I don't, I'm apologize. I don't know if Allison or Hakwa, who put your hand up first, do you know? We also have a bunch of questions in the chat, Donia, that came okay. through your presentation, so. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, let me check in the meantime. Um, yeah, if you wanna ask your question, um, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Um, I'm gonna say- Mr. Wong. Wong. Mr. Wong. Okay, is it okay if I, if I ask a, my question? Yes, please, thank you, so okay. sorry. Thank you, it's all right. Um, so I was just wondering, so regarding engagement, so I understand with virtual engagement because, you know, 2020, we had COVID and all that going on. But I'm just wondering, uh, how have you been relaying these information for people who don't have that kind of accessibility to digital meetings? So uh, what we have done is every session we have held, whether it's a virtual meeting, we send out um, notifications it's, uh, it's a standard process we do because we understand not everybody looks at the internet. So we have sent out mailed notification. So typically for the earlier ones, we have done postcard notifications about you know, the project and giving updates. Hey, this is where we're having a virtual open house. Here's how to connect to and you know, with information for contact. So that has gone out because it's one of the largest corridors. We sent out 20,000 plus postcards you know, for all of the sessions. And on top of that, I want to say, this is just the BRT for Western, right? Keep in mind, since the same time frame, we have had so many BRT related projects ongoing from newborn corridor study, you know, which is the first one in, in the pipelines. We had the newborn design, we had the equitable de development around transit and Western corridor. So what happened was I, what I talked about engagement, we had specific targeted ones for Western, but they were at the same time, we had so many overlapping events also for these other ongoing BRT projects. And one thing we did at all of these uh, events, we made sure that we had updates on every other BRT related projects that was ongoing. So there were ample opportunities and multiple you know, mailing notifications that went out. There's no way, uh, you know, if, if you were paying attention to your mail, uh, you, or, you know, obviously if you're not paying attention on the website, you would have been informed about the process. Um, does that answer your question, Allison? Allison, go ahead uh, while um, I'm succeeding to the- Oh, sure. So um, nice to see you again. We met earlier this summer. I live in Boylan Heights. And I was um, really pleased to see um, many of the things we talked about were addressed in this final report. Um, I do just have a couple clarifying questions and I'm happy to go one at a time if other people wanna jump in or however, feel free to stop me. The first one is um, kind of a, a technical detail question. I noticed that um, in the Dorothea Drive proposed, it is still two way, which is great. Oh, okay. It, I think it is on the thing. I don't hear yes. you. Sorry. Uh, no, I, that's right. We removed okay. one way recommendation. Remember, because yeah, after your meeting. Right. Um, but on the railroad portion, it actually looks like the curve is still notated as one way. And I was wondering if that was a mistake. Uh, I have to check because I know yeah. that it near the railroad. Actually, the door, the um, the street does become one way, right? It's no. Okay, so I have to check the report then. Yeah, yeah we removed the one way recommendation. So you're not going I to thought that so too. way. Yeah, that's probably a little um, leftover. We removed the call out for one yep. way and yep. we removed that from the implementation item as well. Awesome. Um, is it okay if I ask another follow up question? <laughs> okay, great. Um, I just want to clarify when you, um, I also was happy to see it change to um, neighborhood bikeway as opposed to separated connect, you know, thing. And when I, when I hear neighborhood bike, bike way, I'm, I'm kind of thinking sharrows or similar type things. Okay, that's some 
That's right. Yeah. yeah. And that right. was again specifically, uh, you know, after all yeah. meeting and, and negotiation. Yes. Uh, so what it means is now it's just a share. Earlier we were awesome. talking about dedicated, so we changed that designation. Awesome. Thank you. And I think my last question right now, um, and more of a plea, because I'm again really um, happy to see you're going to maintain the vegetative buffer there. Um, our neighborhood would be is trying to actually enhance that on our side of the fence, um, thinking proactively about what's coming. And um, if you have any suggestions for us in terms of how we can move that forward um, to proactively do it, I I feel like it's something that many departments have to sign off on. And um, I'm just hoping that doesn't get caught up in design phase if the, if the intent is obviously to save the area. So, and clearly on our side of, of the fence. Um, so I would really like to work with somebody to, you know, our, our neighborhood is happy to partner either financially or volunteer um, to get some trees planted because there are some very sparse areas and just, wanting to make sure they have time to grow before, before more activity happens. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, uh, I know, I know planning has very little role in, you know, implementation. I, I, I want to check with uh, Jason or Hat if you all have any insight on, you know, the, that side. Um, this is Hat. I will, start i guess you know i know we've communicated in the past again from a brt perspective um within the right away within the ncdot side there are certain limitations because of the clear zone and what can be done on that side mm -hmm. um i i'm happy to hear that you guys are thinking about certain things on the other side of the fence on the dorothea side mm -hmm. um i think we still never quite got to the bottom of the right away on Dorothea, if that's city or um, HOA or, you know, like I, I'm it's not quite city. sure. And so okay. I guess my confusion is if the city is saying it's staying, mm -hmm. but then the city's saying, well, we're not comfortable planting trees, what's the answer? I think what we're saying is we're not sure we can plant trees on the Western Boulevard side of the fence that's, because of clear yeah, zone. Yeah, that's not what I'm asking. I get that. So I think the point of you know moving certain conversations forward in planning on the other side of the fence, um, we would probably would need to get some kind of a conversation going with the city uh, arborist or the um, forestry uh, department, uh, okay. as well as kind of um, something you mentioned with funding programs and, and mm -hmm. something that you guys are working on actively that's great as well but I just I don't have enough background on that side of you know the city okay. uh, perfect works. so I'll actually um, I have an email out to the city and I'll I'll bug them again tomorrow um, because I know that is something that will the transportation I guess department maintains that right of way and so they'll technically have to sign off the ARP, I've been in touch with the forestry department they say okay as long as transportation signs off so I guess I'm not hearing like I, I will I will um, follow up an email tomorrow because <laughs> I think it would really um, make our neighborhood even um, more excited about this project if we knew that um, there would be a great um, buffer to maintain you know both sides of, of Western Boulevard so thank you so much for the questions and I really appreciate y'all um, listening to us and meeting with us earlier this summer it was incredibly helpful um, so thank you sure um, I wanted to get, get uh, to the questions in the chat actually I think the very first was about funding and Jason I know you started uh, I let you kind of pick up on that yeah, to, to expand on my answer, I'll, I'll read what I wrote for those that might be in advice that doesn't read very well. Um, the question was, is there, are there funds already allocated in front of this plan? Or was that, we can answer that later, but the short answer is there are some funds to implement parts of this. And, but in general, the role of this sort of planning effort is not to set up, or it's not only to set up projects the city will invest money in, 
It's also to, to shape the framework for how development and redevelopment happens. So what do new subdivisions look like? What do, um, you know, when, when a apartment complex or an office building or a shopping center is built, they have to build some public improvements. And this helps give the framework for what those things look like. So in those cases, things that are in the plan aren't really often intended to be something the city ever pays for directly. It's something that that future development pays for as a part of their proportional um, con contribution to building out the city. Uh, but, but specifically, the city does have funding to implement area plan projects, though it's not a lot. And there is funding in the wake transit plan reven revenues to implement bus rapid transit, though not enough to implement bus rapid transit just on a local basis. There needs to be some federal or state participation in that. And I'll def defer to head to explain that more fully. But there's a fair amount of money in the financial model for the wake transit plan that'll go to this corridor, is planned to go to this corridor. Matt, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, um, so the wake transit financial plan modeling work um, assumed that, you know, there was a 50 50% um, uh, contribution. So 50% coming from the local wake transit plan funds, uh, revenue funds, and then 50% coming from a federal source. And so that federal process is something that we're currently working through right now. It typically takes a decent amount of time to actually get a project through that federal pipeline and get federal funding. So there are some things that we have to meet before we can get to a point where this project is, the BRT project itself um, is ready for construction. Um, so in terms of something that Jason mentioned, even in the reply, you know, there's a lot of different dotted lines that are identified in the Western Boulevard Corridor Study Report. Some of them are anticipated to be completed as part of potential, you know, redevelopment of certain parcels or, or a redevelopment that occurs along certain parcels. Some of them do, again, have cert certain capital projects that can potentially help um, complete those uh, extensions or dotted lines. I think there was a question uh, about funding, you know, to the purchase of all homes destroyed by the proposed dotted lines. So maybe you can, it's- you can Yeah, and, and is, is E. Lee still with us? Because I think the question, to the answer to that question depends on if you're talking about the Western Boulevard extension, in which case that's about the funding for bus rapid transit, um, or if it's about one of the more other streets in the street plan proposal, in which case generally the city wouldn't be doing those as a public project. The city can of course decide through its legislative powers that it wants to use eminent domain to, to build a street um, wherever it, whenever it would want to, but as, as a practice, we don't build neighborhood streets except through, um, through the development of property around it. Um, so if the question's about a dotted line going through a house that's not Western Boulevard, I think the answer is probably not, but that nobody's going to be looking to purchase that house unless that house were part of a larger development. If it's Western Boulevard, then Heck can answer a little bit about the maybe more specific funding the right of way for Western Boulevard, which might be a little bit more complicated than the entire construction. Right, that's correct, Jason. I was actually gonna add that to, um, you know, along with the 50-50% match. So again, when federal funds are involved um, on this type of a large project, um, the city uh, has to complete uh, environmental documentations under the National Environmental Policy Act um, before any kind of right-of-way acquisitions can be completed. Uh, and so therefore, again, currently there are no funds that can directly be used to do any kind of work along those uh, Western Boulevard extension dotted line. Um, and it would need to go through that design and planning process before we even get to that point. Uh, and again, before we get to construction, as Jason mentioned. Jason mentioned. Okay, yes, I am here. My question was because you, uh, the city of Raleigh has already purchased and destroyed the home that is to the right of us on Buck, <clears throat> excuse me, on Buck Jones Road. And our house, I don't know if our house or just part of our property at this point is going to be eventually taken if the route goes where it's currently proposed. Yeah, so I guess, you know, I'll just kind of follow up to that. Uh, you know, we're pretty early on in the Western BRT design. So would, um, Someone else had this question earlier, uh, or so like shortly right after your question, actually, um, is we are at about 10% design for the Western BRT corridor. 
as we as we advance further into design, um, we will have better information for potential impacts, potential right away uh, considerations. We don't necessarily get to that level of detail until we get to about 60% design. So at 60% design is when we're potentially going to city council, explaining where you know, this dotted line extension is going through and what right of way impacts might be expected from that project. And again, we have to complete a lot of the environmental work and a lot of the other pre-planning work before we can get to that point. Um, the previous purchase that you may you mentioned, you know, um, the Western Boulevard extension has been identified as a streets project for a long time before even the BRT was envisioned to um, use Western Boulevard extension as its alignment. And so some of those property purchases were, or property purchases may have occurred prior to um, the city entering the Western Boulevard corridor into the federal project pipeline. So once we've entered that into the federal project pipeline, we've kind of um, have to go by the, the rules and laws that we have with the federal limitations we have on, on the funding coming from the federal sources. So, so we want to make sure that we're meeting those um, guidelines before we get farther into the process of right-of-way acquisition. What kind of uh, notice would we have that we have to give up our home? Like how much, do you have any idea of like how, what kind of a time period we would have since we would obviously have to move? I mean, my husband's parents built this house 60 year, almost 60 years ago. So we're just kind of trying to figure out what kind of timeline we might have to, in order to try to find something else. So I will, I mean, right now, I guess what I can say is um, to get to even 30% design for Western Boulevard Corridor, we know it's going to take at least another year. Um, to get to 60% design, it's going to take probably another year after that. The environmental documentation, because of the detail required and the work that's needed to complete that is probably a two-year time frame as well, which we have started now. So we will be getting closer to um, some level of additional detail, like I mentioned, about 60% design, maybe towards the end of 2023, early 2024. Um, and then as those federal um, funding allocations potentially line up, we have a better understanding of what may be required. Um, I am not as familiar exactly with the city's, you know, right away process when it gets to construction. Um, but I know that there are federal laws that we have to follow in terms of providing enough notice, providing enough um, fair uh, due diligence work that has to be completed as part of right away acquisition work. Okay, thank you. I see his chat to reach out to you all via email. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, and I could figure out which which home you were talking about. I, to expand on what had just said a little bit, there's a, a federal law called the Uniform Act that this project will have to follow. I don't think either Head or I are, are experts in that because we're kind of early stage planners, not, not right away acquisition and kind of design and construction management um, folks. So I can certainly put you in touch with our real estate staff who do understand that very specifically and, and have been involved in previous purchases or before this was into that federal process. And, um, and hopefully we can get you more solid, more personal answers to your specific situation. Okay, I'll send you an email. Thank you, Jason. You're welcome. And the, the next question was from Jim um, Pamir, I think, about the status of the, um, the design. I think had answered that. Um, he did, he did very much. And yeah, I just asked it because sometimes I'm asked about it or want to present something to someone I'm talking to and letting them know just about where they're at, where you're at is uh, sometimes helpful to their understanding of the, how long the project is along. The next question I see in the chat is um, about the notice this is from this, Danya. This question is yeah. you can probably about, from Peyton yeah. Chung. It's about the, the film changes. Yeah, it says the question says, did notice I the person did notice that CP 10 A21 packet does not include any future land use map changes? I take it that those will be included in the TOD mapping. Danya, can you answer okay. that? Yeah, so, um, so I think when I mentioned in the presentation, right, uh, we did not. Uh, we did not touch on flume changes simply because we have the station area planning process that is going to come forward 
for Western Corridor in the next year or so. And that's when we're going to take a closer look at land use and you know, how additional suite connectivity and urban form. Now, the TOD mapping process is the TOD mapping process is a zoning rezoning process. So we are going to be looking at um, properties on which this can go in as an overlay. So we, we are not going to be making future land use map changes. It's actually going to be a zoning overlay that's going to apply. So there's a slight difference because zoning is what the existing entitlement you have on the project you know, on the on your property, whereas future land use flume future land use. Uh, designations are more guidance, policy guidance for for the future, uh, you know, redevelopment or use of the property. Um, so there's a slight difference. So we think we might have a flume change coming up after the mapping process, but um, at least for the time being, the mapping is actually looking at applying the overlay zoning uh, to properties using a certain set of criteria that um, again, we will learn more about it at the upcoming meetings uh, scheduled for this month about you know, what are those criteria is. Um, and this is again, city initiated. So we are, going to, we are going to be a little conservative. Obviously, you know, we're not going to apply it on single family uh, properties unless of course, you know, there's compelling reason if they desire to, but mostly looking at probably existing mixed use, um, mixed use zoning or uses as well as probably larger density residential zoning. So that's kind of in general. So stay tuned, there's more coming and we hope all of you would continue to stay engaged with that process. Donnie, does the planning department plan to consider making future land use map amendments as a part of a stationary planning effort? Or yes. am I remembering that incorrectly? So, yes. so there is uh, something in the work plan to consider making those, those changes, but it's not the TOD mapping. Mm -hmm. Is and, and I realized that the person who asked the question said that they had to leave, but there may be other people looking, you know, wondering the same thing. Um, what's the timeline for the station area planning? So that is again dependent on the um, the grant. I know for Newborn Corridor, we have the station area planning process that kicked off because we were able to get the TOD federal TOD grant uh, for that. We have to apply for that grant. I think we applied, right? Het, Hetman can give an update on that. But we did apply for that grant, but we don't know if we have been awarded that because we cannot, you know, that it, it takes money and effort. So we, we cannot uh, kick off on that process without um, the financial aid for planning that. Het, do you have any update on that? Uh, I was going to say that's correct. We have applied for the similar TOD grant that we are working on New Bern Station Area Planning with, and we have not heard back yet from the Federal Transit Administration on that uh, grant award. Uh, we do anticipate to hear back maybe sometime by the end of this year or early next year on that, um, and then would probably follow a similar time frame that New Bern did with uh, beginning work on it, which takes about a couple months to start that work and then about 12 months to actually complete that work. Next question, I think Jason, you might be more. Um, there's a question from Anthony. Can you speak to the effect of BRT? Yeah. Anthony uh, Gregg, I think is how his, his name is pronounced, says, can you speak to the effect of the BRT plan on Boylan Avenue? Is it going to become a major artery to get to a station or Dick's Park? How should we expect to see traffic patterns change? I don't think that you should expect to see traffic patterns change much. It will not be used to route BRT. That is, that is known for certain. Um, I believe, and Heck can talk a little bit more about the, the BRT locally preferred alternative in the 10% design, but I think there is an expectation to put a station at Boylan Avenue on Western Boulevard. So certainly from a pedestrian access standpoint, Boylan Avenue will be very important so that, so that people in Boylan Avenue and in Dix Park will have a way to get to that station. Uh, but there won't be any sort of park and ride or, or um, vehicle drop off as a part of that station, unless I'm, unless I'm mistaken, that will correct me. I think the plan does make recommendations to turn the right now kind of unsignalized traffic focused, uh, vehicle traffic focused intersection at Boylan Avenue into a more traditional city intersection that would allow some additional movements, um, but not necessarily a, any more volume per se. Um, so right now, to cross as a pedestrian, you kind of go a little bit away from Boylan, 
you push the button, you wait your turn, you cross, and you come back to where you wanted to be, it'd be a more normal street corner and that people could go on their bike straight through on Boylan. Uh, but we're not going to widen Boylan Avenue. There, the plan isn't to uh, remove the four all-way stops and to get to, to get from, excuse me, to get from Western Boulevard to downtown Raleigh, BRT will at least initially take um, Salisbury and Wilmington. Um, it may in the future, there's a, one of the recommendations of the plan, one of the street plan am amendments is to extend West Street south and to basically bring a part of what's now kind of a highway interchange at, um, at Dawson and McDowell and MLK into more of an inner, of a, we call it a square loop, but basically extend the street grid and get rid of the highway interchange and have another city block um, to, uh, to ex add to the land that, that, um, that Heritage Park um, can, can use and, and could re redevelop themselves into a larger site. Um, that'd be very similar to what the city in consult and work with NCDOT, the State Department of Transportation did at um, Capitol Boulevard and P Street. And that project just finished up a, a year or maybe six months ago. I don't remember the exact date now. Um, but that kind of configuration of a series of right turns rather than a emerging sort of uh, turn would potentially help take some of the pressure off of Boylan Avenue because there'd be another way into kind of the warehouse district and the at least the southeastern corner of Boylan Heights. Um, and hopefully that answers your question. Heck, do you have anything to add about BRT specifically in my answer? I don't think so. I think you covered everything pretty well. Uh, one comment is that, again, we have to wait for what the design phase, you know, the 10 person design phase to know where our final station locations are. So um, I know we have proposed station locations, but we don't know if any one of those would move or um, change. So that's something to, to also keep in mind and see. We don't know that yet. Um, I think there's one, Jason, maybe you could talk a little bit about that Greenway trail from Isaac. Yeah. Danya, can you pull up your presentation and go to the, I think it's probably the area specific guidance map that visually might help me answer the question. It might okay, help make sure. my answer more clear, everybody. Yep, sure. um, the question from, from Isaac, my screen is hiding your last name, sir, um, is I see what looks like that there, it looks like there could be a greenway trail that crosses I-440 from Blue Ridge Road southeastward, but then a greenway corridor that continues southeastward to Avent Ferry. Um, so that is the diagonal green line. Okay, I, I understand. Um, Danya, this is the, um, this is actually a recommendation, or at least part of it was from the Avent Ferry Corridor Study. So the, the park there at Kaplan Drive, I think it's called Kaplan Drive Park, but I could be remembering the name of that city park incorrectly, is a city park near the corner of Kent and Kaplan Drive. And there is in the city's greenway plan, a greenway corridor designated along that stream, which actually crosses Western Boulevard very close, or crosses I-440 very close to Western Boulevard. Um, the Avent Ferry Corridor study recommended extending a greenway trail from the Walnut Creek Greenway Trail um, north westward to that park and to Kaplan Drive. The rest of the core, the Greenway corridor, and so uh, to give a little bit of, um, I'll, I'll try to put on my parks planner hat here, the, um, the city of Raleigh uses greenways, a greenway as in two different ways. One of them is the protection of the corridor around a creek or a stream or a brook um, for mostly environmental purposes, for water quality, for, for species protection and, and other things. That often we put trails in those corridors. I don't know for certain if the Greenway corridor from Kaplan Drive to I-440 is intended to or is likely to include a trail on it. It's mostly parallel with Onslow Drive, which is a street right of way with, you know, and actually I think it's one of the, the handful of, of unpaved roads in the city of Raleigh. Um, the, there wouldn't be, I can be pretty certain that there wouldn't be a separate Greenway Trail crossing I-440 near that location, that, that any sort of crossing would be kind of is, and actually is planned to be built into the interchange work at I-440 and Western Boulevard that's happening right now. 
Um, but the idea is, I think, that there could be to connect the, the, the neighborhood southeast of I-440 and Western to the north and, and towards you know, Carter-Finley and the Blue Ridge Corridor area and the Arboretum, there is a recommendation for a new greenway trail that, that Donnie, I think, is highlighting there um, in that area. And that uses a fair amount of NC State University property, and, and that recommendation was made in consultation with them to kind of link up the Arboretum as, a, as an outdoor recreational and, and um, environmental amenity with some of the other parts of campus and the, um, and the development around the Blue Ridge and Western Boulevard area, um, which of course the interchange project right now is gonna be adding a complete sidewalk on one side and a multi-use path on the other through, um, through the interchange. And, and then the, I'm not as certain about the gap in between of whether there would be a separate greenway trail, um, but certainly the neighborhood streets can, can serve a part of that function. Um, so I think that that hopefully answers your question. If it doesn't, please raise your hand or put something in the chat. And um, the next question is from um, Pao, Pao Wong. And I, I'm sorry, I'm probably not saying your name correctly, sir. Um, that my understanding is that the, this project affects Dorothea Drive Heritage Park is a black community that is located on Dorothea Drive. What consideration has been made to ensure protection of the community in Heritage Park? Danya, is that a, a, a question yeah. you can answer? Yeah, I mean, so uh, it's a question. So one of our, um, we actually just had a recent meeting with the um, Raleigh Housing Authority and they are looking to redevelop the property, the Heritage Park site. Uh, again, for more affordable housing. And so uh, we just had a great discussion. The city is actually going to partner with them. And I think Jason kind of touched on one of the street network proposed for that uh, you know, site where we are proposing to grid it up so you can actually get more developable blocks um, for that site and be able to leverage better on the additional density bonuses, as well as um, ability to densify and get more housing um, stock in, in uh, on the site. So uh, it's actually a great partnership and we are, the city leadership just met with, with, um, with their leadership and there's that ongoing conversation um, to come up with the uh, good, good uh, master plan for that site. And we are also helping with um, obviously uh, you know, pro coordination with NCDOT on um, on some of the cleanup of where you're cleaning up the South Dawson McDowell interchange, and then being able to have the square loop and um, have that uh, ability to reclaim some land for redevelopment. So, um, so obviously, you know, it's a great opportunity, and the folks there um, managing things that it's a great opportunity to ensure not only protection, but also being able to get more affordable housing in such close proximity to the BRT corridor. So that, um, you know, it's ongoing and you probably see that we are very excited. The city is also very excited for that um, potential partnership opportunity to help each other. And obviously the housing in neighborhoods is also, um, um, I want to make make very clear that when you say redevelop, it that does not mean vacate it as public housing no, no. and turn it into something else. Yeah. yeah. Um, though, though, while I think it's true, the the exact nature of the Raleigh Housing Authority's um, control relative to city government is not something that that I'm aware of in my professional role. There, it is not directly city staff that are controlling this. Um, nor is it directly city council in my understanding. So there's kind of a partnership there of sorts. And, and what we expect from the conversations we have is that the Raleigh Housing Authority is trying to add to their stock of housing and over time redevelop into something that will provide a better community that includes the people that are there. But of course, I can't speak for what RHA is going to do, neither can Donnie Arhett. It's, it's really what the housing authority is, is planning to do with that and that we are trying to work with them to help facilitate what, what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, and, and, and the, our goal is there, it's very clear, is to be able to support RHA's goals because it's very important for us 
uh, to enhance. Again, we have the equitable development on transit plan that talked about how important it is to accommodate additional density for affordable housing purposes along this corridor. So it's a great uh, opportunity that we have the right partners that you know who, who want to invest in that and be able to do it in phases over time. So you actually get get that you know accomplished over over time. Um, okay, what well, we do have more questions. So I think uh, Head, do you have one from Mark? Um, is yeah, that I, was, I was actually going to respond to a couple questions that Mark had because they were all BRT related, sort of all together. Um, so Mark, the first one you had was about potential start date to any construction. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, we're pretty early on in the design stage, a 10% design, and we have to uh, work with the federal process to get federal funding allocation and even, you know, um, wait till we have a federal grant awarded on that allocation before we can go into any construction. So our current assumption is um, the earliest construction on Western Corridor is potentially in the 2025 timeframe. Uh, with potential service in 2027. Uh, and again, this is all contingent that we can get that federal funding that was um, identified in the Wake Transit Plan to be uh, combined with the local funds to complete that project. So that's the note or caveat that I would add. Um, one, of your, uh, one of your other questions was if it is a transit station act or what it actually looks like, is it simply a bus stop or is it a station? Uh, so where we are able to with uh, right away, as well as with NCDOT clear zone requirements, we do have BRT stations that are level boarding, which means they are um, slightly higher than your regular curb uh, height, making it easier for people to board uh, and get off the bus uh, faster. And so in those areas, uh, it would feel more like a transit station in some of the other areas where we are not able to do that and the station is um, not level boarding. Uh, it could look more similar to a local bus stop, but it will still have some amenities that have been identified on the BRT um, uh, system-wide components. And so I'm gonna post a few links in this chat for the BRT page on the city's website. There's a, a video that we completed a 30% design for New Bern Avenue that shows what BRT stations could potentially look like and how to access stations, especially when stations are in the median as opposed to along the curbside. So, there, so there's some good information on the city's website on that. We actually have some renderings that we completed for New Bern Avenue as well that kind of show that uh, really well. So I'll post a couple links after I'm done talking. Um, and then the last question you had, and Dania, maybe I'll ask for your help on this one. Um, it's the most recent one that was typed in, but what is the plan for transit station near Kmart and Blue Ridge? It is, is it going to be in the media, in the middle of Western or on the Kmart property? Will there be parking at the station? So the current, again, 10% design assumption is that the station at Blue Ridge is within the median. Um, again, this could potentially change as we go into a more advanced design. Um, and then in terms of um, parking at the station, I think that's something that the station area planning work would look at a little bit more closely when we get to it, um, because that's the work that looks at, you know, a, a quarter mile radius within this around the stations and identifying land use opportunities as well as potential opportunities for access and connecting to the BRT stations. Yeah, I think you kind of covered that well, Ed. Uh, uh, yeah, and sorry, uh, Mark, the, the, the middle of Western Boulevard, not, off, not on Blue Ridge. The, the corridor itself the is Western Boulevard, so it would just stay on Western Boulevard and stop within Western Boulevard. Okay, Jason, I think you could probably do the one from Jill Hartman about uh, the sidewalk connectivity. Yeah, I'll, I'll read this for everybody's benefit. It says, there is a significant lack of sidewalk connectivity leading to Western Boulevard. For example, on Powell Drive, the feeder streets into Powell Drive all lack sidewalk connectivity, including Driftwood, Huntington, and Melbourne. Even Powell Drive itself lacks sidewalk connectivity. This is in spite of new construction, including new cottages, which lack sidewalks. Is the current UDO at odds with the BRT planning? 
what can be done now to prepare sidewalk connectivity? It doesn't seem that walkability can occur without sidewalks unless we all <laughs> levitate our way to the BRT from our residents. Thanks. Uh, those are very good questions. Um, the first part of it is, and I think those are very much concerns of and the reason we're doing this planning and and something that is absolutely a prerequisite is, is sidewalks, I think. Um, the question of whether the current UDO is at odds with BRT planning, I don't think it's at odds. It's certainly the, the way the UDO and development of property in Raleigh's regulatory regime works. If you have a lot and it is already platted and you build on that lot, up to a certain size of structure, you do not have to make improvements to the public street in front of your property. So as a, for instance, I've, I've been involved with a project along Carolina Avenue, which connects to Powell Drive and connects to Western Boulevard, where there's a lot of, um, it, previously people often bought two or three lots and put a house on two or three lots. And that what happens over time is, is the house you know, gets a little bit older and the land becomes more valuable. A developer build, buys that house, tears down that and then takes back those three lots, puts them back to the three lots originally there and then builds three houses on them. Um, when that happens, there are no there is no requirement to build sidewalks. Um, the benefit is that you can build more housing less expensively, um, but it doesn't result in additional sidewalks. If there's a subdivision or a tier three site plan and, and the tier system is something that's newer in our UDO, um, but, but to explain it very, very briefly, a tier one site plan is basically somebody coming in to put a, a small structure on an existing lot. Um, I think up to and including a single family home, home on a platted lot. A tier two, uh, jump to a tier three is the sort of thing that might result in a 30 story office building or a, you know, a shopping center somewhere or a gas station or, or that sort of development where there wasn't development before or where there was a very much less intense amount of development. And a tier two is, is somewhere in between, um, but probably closer to the smaller one. And, I, and honestly, because I don't deal with development review personally, I don't think I can articulate exactly the difference between a tier one and a tier two. But a tier three site plan, which along Western Boulevard in, in that corridor, as a for instance, would be some of the new housing along Hillsboro by Burton Avenue that was built a few years ago or within the last year or so, that was certainly a tier three site plan. And a subdivision is whenever you, somebody takes one lot and divides it into more than one lot. Um, those are both situations where there's a lot of requirements to build new streets and add, um, bring current streets up to standard, including building sidewalks. Um, but the challenge is in an area that was platted out a long time ago that if development is in a tier one and tier two site plan, there isn't a requirement of those developers to build the sidewalk. And that, that can be a bit frustrating and it's, I think, a fair amount of what you're seeing in some of the neighborhoods south of Western Boulevard or kind of in between Jones Franklin and the university. Um, and, and so then what we have to do to get those sidewalks is that the city has to, to budget funding to design and construct sidewalks along those neighborhood streets. And, and there are certain cases where we're already doing that. Um, I think it will take a lot more and it'll take a lot of time to do that. But as a, for instance, there are some sidewalk petition projects where property owners petitioned or neighbors petitioned to build sidewalks near Western, not directly to it, can, you know, serving Gorman. Um, on, I think it's Markham, Kelford, and Burt, if I remember the streets correctly. And the project I mentioned earlier on Carolina Avenue is actually a street improvement petition to put curb and gutter and sidewalk in. And that should be going to city council for approval in, in the next few, um, next month or two here. Um, those types of projects are, are part of what will be necessary to, to build out the full sidewalk network, um, but they don't necessarily have to be petitions. The city can initiate those directly, and this, this planning effort helps us you know, prioritize and, and identify the most important links there. Hopefully that answers your question, Mr. Hartman. Um, I'm going to jump to the next question here that's from Stephanie is the first name. I don't see the last name because of the way my screen's truncated, but many multifamily and single family homes front Western in this region, some very close to the street. How will these particular, those very close to the street be affected? Will these homeowners be consulted in the design phase? Um, I'll speak generally about the city doing public projects and, and cons consulting with four streets and consulting with property owners that will be affected. 
Um, and some of this is, is refinements of, of traditional processes. But when we do a street project, whether or not it's BRT and it's, it's widening or changing a street and it's expanding that right of way, what the city does now is we have a 25% public meeting. And at that stage, the project manager will also be reaching out to property owners that they believe will be impacted in some way. Will it be a, an offer to purchase either permanent right of way or an, an offer to purchase temporary easements to either change the grade or rebuild driveways or, or just temporarily occupy property so that we can do the construction. Um, and that's before the exact definition of those impacts is fully known because the project isn't fully designed. But there, there is a direct outreach so that hopefully people's questions get answered and they become a part of that process, can give a little bit of input into the design and know what to expect earlier. And I don't think that this would be any different other than the, the caveat that Het gave earlier that before we can get into that, we need to have the, the environmental documentation done and need to identify some amount of, of okay from the federal government to be participating in negotiations for that. Um, until then, we can't do that, but we're only at about 10% design now. We'd usually do that at 25% design. Um, and let me see, Head, is there another question there, another answer to that question that I'm missing? No, I just wanted to add, I think more specifically or more broadly, I guess, um, you know, for the BRT projects, we have been doing mailers similar to what Danya mentioned um, along the corridor uh, in a quarter mile buffer along the alignment. So all property owners within that quarter mile buffer uh, are getting notices about potential virtual open houses that we have during public engagement. Um, we're conducting currently virtual open houses again because of the COVID uh, situation or environment. Um, but, it, you know, in a potential future, we will start having some smaller group meetings uh, as part of design open house events. As we advance design on the Western Corridor, there'll definitely be more opportunities for um, people along frontage, people, uh, property owners along the fringe of Western Boulevard to get it uh, involved in the design process for the Western Corridor um, and, and sort of be uh, up to date on, on, on how that's progressing. And I'll add one more thing. I don't think it's it's every section of Western Boulevard will not will not necessarily need, be, need to be widened in order to build this BRT project. So there are some areas where the existing edge of the street will stay substantially the same. We may be improving things with sidewalks and other amenities, but it's not that everything's always getting bigger. Um, though I'm sure there are some cases where where we expect them to get bigger. And of course, the Western Boulevard extension will be a new street where where a street does not currently exist. I think the next questions, Danya, are um, specific field to spring, field, field spring, spring. Yes. in the chat. And um, Steve Burt is saying that he's going to have to leave at eight. Um, but I wonder if there was another one below that. Um, no, a quick follow up, and, and, and then maybe we will be able to address field spring specifically before, before eight o'clock. Um, yeah, follow up um, about. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, Diana. there's. I think there's one question which is not. Yeah, I was going to read this. Yeah, go ahead. Is there any possibility the lack of requirement to build a sidewalk on older plotted properties could change in the future? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. There's a part of that that comes down to what is our city council's policy going to be? What do they want to make the requirements in the law, and what legislative action would they take? And of course, I can't speak to what the politicians will decide to do. I, I work for them and do what they, they tell me to do. Um, there's also the possibility that it may not be perfectly legal for them to do so um, within state law. Um, and, and that comes down to a judgment partially of whether the requirement is proportional to the amount of, um, the, the amount of impact of that development. So to give an extreme example, if I, have a, if I'm going to build a, a one house and I'm, and I purchased 10 acres of farmland and the state wants to build a highway through, through the corner of my property, I don't have to build them a piece of highway that would be disproportionate for my development. Um, but there is from that extreme down to the less, the, the opposite extreme where I'm going to build a thousand story you know, or not thousands or a thousand foot skyscraper in a downtown where there's no sidewalk on the street and I'm going to put in a sidewalk 
that's an obviously proportional impact. There, there's a gray line there. And I think attorneys often argue about where that line fits. And, and, and so those are two parts of the answer. Um, but it's theoretically, it could change. There has not been discussions to my knowledge that, that there, there is a discussion of that change. Um, the Joe Hartman um, gave the comment that the city is only giving lip service to walkability access. Um, I, I understand why, why you would say that, sir, and, and we do need more funding for sidewalks and, and the ability to, to build more of them. And in a lot of parts of the city that were built in between, say, the middle of the Great Depression and the late 1990s don't have enough sidewalks. And that's, a, that's one of the things that occupies a lot of my time and, and causes me a lot of worry. And, and we're certainly doing our best. Um, and then the next question from Stephanie, can you address the intersection of West, Western and Heather Drive specifically? Um, I think I'm gonna put a pin in that for a second. And Danya, can you, while I research that question, I'm gonna go look at, at the map and be able to answer that very specific question. Can you start the re answering some of the questions about Field Spring or at least reading what they are and explaining to the folks who don't who weren't a part of the last meeting um, that there was a discussion previously? Yeah, um, I can do that. I'm just, just going to um, go back and look at your first question, um, Steve. Hey, thank you, Danya and Jason. I appreciate it. Um, OK, go ahead. Um, widening. So you, the first was about, so for those of, of you who have, you know, are, well, I guess don't know the context. So we did have, like we have uh, new street connections proposed. There's uh, a set of uh, street connections proposed for the Jones Franklin area and one, um, one specific segment where we are proposing to connect the existing leg of Field Spring Lane with the new segment to connect back to Jones Franklin. And that's, uh, uh, we had a lot of discussion around that um, at the last um, Oscar Planner session. We understand there's, uh, you know, concerns and, and the neighborhood does not like to see that connection. But again, I think we um, had gave ample, you know, explanation of why we think it's some of these are important is really planning for that future. And I think someone brought up the question about lack of sidewalk connectivity. That's exactly, you know, some of those reasons where, you know, back in the, back in the days, we did not have a policy for in, in ensuring adequate street sidewalk connectivity for all development plans. And today, after many years, we are now struggling. Uh, to fix that problem. Obviously, new developments will be required, but we, how do you catch up for that? And what did, today, when you look back, some of those subdivisions are, um, you know, they would be much better off if they had a sidewalk, right? So it's the very same situation where you um, kind of lend that to street connectivities. We're not looking at existing conditions, but when we plan for the future growth and development, some of these uh, street connections become so critical so that 10, 20 years, 30 years uh, down the lane, you're not going back and saying, well, why didn't the planners plan for this? This is really bad, right? Because we, we exact, that's exactly the goal is we want to be thinking ahead and planning for that basic framework where streets, sidewalks are the fundamental, uh, you know, what you call like the basic bones that support good uh, orderly planned growth. And so that's uh, essentially why we do it. And, and getting back to this Field Spring Lane question, is there any way we can get more clarity on what is being proposed for Field Spring Lane street widening? What are the specific measurements for the street widening? You're anticipating what's the timeline? If you don't know, what's the city's best guess? Okay, I know Jason can probably touch more on that because that's his area of expertise. But uh, what I know the last meeting, we, we talked about two street designations, right? One is the neighborhood street is the designation we are, um, we are proposing for that existing uh, street. Where it's built to currently is, is to neighborhood yield that, and now uh, I can actually show, pull up the street segment so that Jason can kind of uh, talk a little more. But um, again, that is for, for upgrading or upgrading it to the, the existing standards. But what's the timeline? We do not know. 
because obviously we don't have funding and we're not going to do it unless, of course, something triggers a redevelopment or one of the parcels in your lane decide they want to sell off and somebody else wants to redevelop. So there's no timeline. And I, I don't think any of us can guess that. I mean, it's, it's really dependent on the property owner, but um, I can pull up that PowerPoint uh, for Jason so Jason can actually um, that, that might be use, that might be useful, Danya. I wanted yeah. to make sure that, that Mr. Burt and his neighbor saw the um, present or I'm sorry, saw the memo that went to the Planning Commission Committee of the whole to help them sorry. understand this issue. Um, and, and that basically laid out four different options from keep the plan exactly as it is now to implement area specific guidance in two different ways or to just remove any 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 guidance about this area in its entirety. Um, and so um, if you haven't seen that memo, um, please um, set, chat me or send me an email and I can forward you a copy of that. It, it's already on the city's website. It was a part of the agenda materials for the meeting that had to have been canceled, um, but, but I can make it very quickly available to you. The, the, for everybody's benefit, the image on the left is a neighborhood street. I'm sorry, the, yeah, the left is a neighborhood street is one of our street standards for what might be called in some places a neighborhood collector. This is one of the more major neighborhood streets that probably has other neighborhood streets that are smaller coming off of it um, in our street design manual, which is a little bit more technical than this, um, than, than, than just the UDO. It gets into some more specifics. It um, <clears throat> excuse me, it specifies how many units and how long the street can be. Um, the idea of a neighborhood street is that it allows for people to park on both sides of the street and pass traffic in two ways at the same time. And, and one of the reasons for that is to make sure that there's adequate emergency access um, in the event of, of there being, uh, you know, somebody has a heart attack and the fire department sends the nearest truck or something. That is what the proposed street plan amendment for Field Spring, both the existing and the dotted line for the new section of street heading eastward looks like right now. Um, and as we talked about in the last meeting, that may not be appropriate. And the only way that the city would implement this or the only way we would expect to be implemented is if the properties in front of the street were to um, be, be developed into something different, which as we talked about is probably not likely. The other side of the image, which which Danya took down, is a smaller street. It's the smallest street for a neighborhood. We call the neighborhood yield, and that does not allow two-way traffic. And that's probably the exact dimension from a curb-to-curb -curb standpoint that um, Field Spring already is. Um, with the difference being that Field Spring doesn't have a sidewalk on both sides, and therefore the the, the right of way squeezed down a little bit. Um, so. So what the, what the memo to Planning Commission Committee of the Whole gave them options for was keep it as neighborhood street in the street plan, put a street connection in the area specific guidance, which wouldn't do anything to Field Spring, but it would influence how development on Jones Franklin and or redevelopment of the apartment of the senior housing complex would happen. And that that could specify a street of any, spe any specification that, that the plan would want to, to, to provide. We don't really, ask them to do anything specific. The third option would be to not put a street, but to put in area specific guidance, a bike and pedestrian connection. But the, the downside of that is the city has no ability to actually require that. And then the third is to take any guidance off completely. And so I expect that when the committee of the whole meets on the 18th, they'll, they'll look at this issue, they'll ask some questions and they'll, they'll make a recommendation to staff on how they want the comp plan amendment changed or not, and how they want the report to be changed behind it. Um, and hopefully that answers um, most of your questions. Um, and I think it, it has gets- Comments about um, neighborhood preservation and how uh, the community can engage in the design phase. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, we don't even know when that's ever going to materialize, but obviously if it does, Again, it can only happen if redevelopment occurs, and you know we typically have notification process of engaging every uh, property owner um, within a certain feet foot. So, yeah, we don't even know at this time. I mean, it really depends on that redevelopment process, and it may be ten years or twenty years from now. But yes, that's uh, you'll all be engaged, obviously, as as being part of that neighborhood. Drainage flooding, I don't know, Jason, if they had any specific comments. Again, 
Um, I actually have the stormwater pulled up because of the question about Heather Drive. I okay. believe that Field Spring drains down. And, and so anything that would happen on the south end of Field Spring or east of Field Spring wouldn't wouldn't influence Field Spring itself. That's downstream of, of the neighborhood itself. So the reason that that things changed on when Buck Jones was built is because that is upstream of you. And, and the BRT project is upstream of you too. So that's something to be engaged through, engaged in through the design of BRT and changes that that'll result in, in, in Western Boulevard extension where Buck Jones is currently. Uh, but I don't think that anybody on this call is, is really an expert on stormwater engineering or can answer that too much other than that that's an important part of, of designing roadway and street projects and, and sidewalk projects for that matter is, is how they drain and how we handle both the water quantity and water quality impacts of, of rain, rain events and basically storms. Um, I would like to, to if there are follow-up questions. Yeah, I just want to sit, tell you and Danya, thank you. You did a really nice job of addressing our questions. I appreciate it. I'll probably follow up with you about the memo that you recommended. And um, you know, thanks for thinking about stormwater. We, it was just an issue. We're, we're a little concerned about widening because of some past work that a neighbor of uh, mine worked on and just an issue that we were sensitive to and thinking about. So th thank you for being thoughtful with your responses and I, I appreciate it. And, oh, and I have one follow-up for you guys. The last, um, the last question here from Mark is about has the has my have my colleagues surveyed the street? My understanding is they are planning to accept the street for city maintenance and and have done that already. I don't know when that's official, um, but but it's it seemed like it's just basically a done deal. And, and for everybody's benefit, when we were asked questions about Field Spring, it, it became apparent that. The street wasn't on the city's inventory of city maintained streets, even though everything pointed to it being built to be a city maintained street and it's certainly in a public right of way. Um, so we did a little research had people go out and look at it and there, and it seemed like everything that wasn't perfect or things that they would normally address with regular maintenance. So I think that is it is going to be accepted or has been accepted for city maintenance. Um, and if you guys need a very specific confirmation of that um, send me an email and I can. I can put you in touch with my colleagues. Um, the, I'd like to address the Western and, and Heather question a little bit more specifically. Um, it sounds like I was trying to get, uh, this may be a question that was direct to me, I'm sorry, um, and, and, and not to the group. So I actually sent um, a staff chat to my colleagues saying, hey, can you address this issue? And they can't read it. So I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully Heck can kind of talk us through a little bit of what um, of what the, the design for BRT looks like in this area. Um, you guys can see my IMAPs, correct? Yeah, we can see it, Jason. So this is Heather Drive here um, between Powell and, um, and Grove. And the question was about let me see if I can't get the chat and at the same time I'll read it aloud to everybody. Um, where's the chat? Sure, there it is. It says, can you address the intersection of Western and Heather Drive specifically? Our townhouse is very close to the road, plus the city has drainage between us and the road. Is this a portion of Western that could be wide? And so I'm not sure if the townhouse is either new construction here, or I imagine it's one of these off of Powell, or maybe it's in, um, in this here, but it, maybe the question doesn't really need to be specific to this, the, some of these specific unit. Um, and what I told Pat was that I can only really say that we might put the water that's right now going through an open drainage into a pipe, if that was appropriate, and what the existing right away with is here roughly. Um, but I don't know what the plans, if the 10% plans are for this area. Is that something you can answer, Hat, at this meeting? Um, I mean, I can provide what our current assumption shows at 10%, but I just want to caveat because, you know, as we go through uh, project design, especially something as big as the BRT project, um, there are times where we are dealing with um, 
right away constraints or even in situations where we think the right away exists we may end up deciding to keep the project costs lower by staying within the right away in certain areas so um, currently there is in the 10% design plans sidewalk on the north side of western boulevard along western boulevard um, that looks like would uh, sort of be in I won't say in the right of way, but like right at the edge of that right of way there. Um, so with those improvements, there would definitely be some level of uh, um, improvements that would be making to uh, stormwater and water as well, since it would um, add curb and gutter and um, infrastructure along Western Boulevard with sidewalk. Uh, do we... I would I would say to just kind of keep in tune with as we advance ten, you know um further into the design stage to see if that uh sidewalk is is staying where it is um sort of what the other uh brt running way options look like uh currently it is uh, again in the 10 percent design assume that the brt would be in the median here at western boulevard and so that is one of the reasons why there is a little bit of widening as well as um that sidewalk work with carbon gutter happening and, and, and Stephanie asked me, what is the blue line? What I've turned on here on top of the aerial photo is the city's stormwater GIS data. It, is, it basically communicates what the infrastructure is to convey water. It, this, this IMAPS is publicly available. Everybody can go to maps.rallync.gov. And in this particular layer is under the utilities option. Um, but what the blue line is, is that it's, it's, it's kind of like a uh, could be a creek and in places where there are creeks like maybe this would be a creek up here it is a creek in other places it's just an open drain you know like a ditch or a swale or something um i think the yellow feature and i can identify it here it will tell us what it is is either um well let's just let it say what it is um property it is the it is called a BMP, which basically means this is functioning like a treatment for water quality. So the water goes into that, nutrients are kind of consumed by, by plants that are living in it, or they settle out into the bottom of it, or algae and things that, that live in that water help absorb the nutrients so that as the water goes downstream, there's less nutrients being added to the streams and, and, and reducing water quality downstream of us. Um, and so if it is a BMP, it may be that part of what the, um, the, the construction here would do is, is to either modify it or move it or put it in a different place or, or have to mitigate it by building another one in another place. Um, while the, the blue line being above ground water conveyance may be put underground um, so that the sidewalk can go in in that location. I think that I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see better what the um, there it is. What the chat says, and um, if there are any other questions. Um, and and uh, Isaac is giving me good good input on how to uh, to to try to speak in a clear manner for everybody here. I apologize if I'm using some some jargon. Um, it's certainly not easy all the time. Uh, if anybody still has a question, I, I think we should, you know, I'd like you to raise your hand or just unmute yourself and speak up or type it in the chat. I'm not sure if we've, um, if we've gotten everybody and, and I don't want to leave anybody out. I think we may have touched on all the comments, the questions in the chat, or maybe one little comment to add. I know um, Joe makes a good point about, you know, the importance of, of sidewalk connectivity. I just want to add, like, that's absolutely, I mean, from planning perspective, right, that's something we lobby hard for. And um, I do want to say that for Western Corridor especially, we will be looking and taking a closer look at sidewalk connectivity during the station area planning process, where we're going to focus in on the station nodes. Um, and we didn't get to, to uh to validating you know, the sidewalk connectivity at this point simply because it's, we're focused at a more corridor level. So we're looking at larger scale street connections, bike connections, 
uh, but that's definitely on the dock for um, once the station locations are confirmed. We are already starting to do that for newborn corridor station nodes, so it's it's a high priority because we understand that these you know if there's no sidewalk connectivity, obviously no one's going to walk, and and we think that it's really really critical to have these connections to surrounding areas for BRT to be successful. So you know there's no point us investing so many million dollars on the BRT if there's absolutely no connectivity. And, and that applies to, you know, at all levels, from, from sidewalk to street to additional modes of uh, connectivity. So that's where we are striving hard and struggling. Um, again, funding is a problem, obviously, but we, we believe that, you know, once you put a plan forward, we will figure out ways in which you can get it done. So we're, we're trying our best there. But yeah, we understand it's a great common um, and, and make sure, uh, you know, you all voice your opinions too when you when we have these planning processes, we we want that. We want to hear that come from citizens. It's not just planners, you know, trying to make the pitch. We want to make sure we document um, that it's a priority for, for the community as well. Um, is there anybody else who, you know, who wants to share any last minute comments or anything you're happy, you know, to, 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 be here if you need additional time with us. Um, I don't see any hands raised. Thank was, you all for your time. Yeah, so if, if there's no more additional comments, we just want to you know wrap up and say once again, thank you so much for taking your time and, and being here again. We value this opportunity because there's, it's always hard, right? We put so much of information out and, and we want to make sure we are available for citizens and all of you to clarify and provide additional information. So we appreciate uh, you, know, you all taking the time and being here. I want to remind everyone that the next meeting of this project to be reviewed by the Planning Commission would be on November the 18th. And we'll obviously post that information on the web because that's a rescheduled date. And unfortunately, I have a conflict, uh, so I'm going to be out of country, so I won't be able to attend. But Jason Myers and someone else will be representing the project from City End uh, at that specific meeting. So um, with that, I, you know, hopefully, so the, the conversation will continue. So, you know, feel free to engage with the Planning Commission and share your thoughts, whether it's in support of or not support of. They would value, you know, feedback from the from uh, um, is that it or do I see any more last minute comments? Okay, I, it's just thank you. It's the only thing. Yeah. I I think the the meeting I guess is probably officially over. Um, okay. I want to make sure before the host, which would be Donnie and I, leave that we make sure we save this correctly if we needed to do anything. Um, though Donnie, you recorded it, so I think yes. that that you're in control of that, so. Okay, I'm gonna um, say recording stop.